Well, welcome to the BIS Innovation Summit. I'm Stephanie Flanders, head of Bloomberg Economics, and I'm delighted to be moderating this session on a very uh, uh, important topic that we see central banks in particular commenting on almost uh, every day, uh, the development of digital currencies and the potential role for regulators and central banks uh, within uh, that emerging landscape as we all um, use uh, digital uh, for currencies and assets um, more and more in our daily lives and more and more of the world's uh, financial transactions are are based on these uh, are based on these things and I'm delighted that we've got some some really excellent uh, contributors to this panel some of whom have been pioneers uh, in this in this debate um, uh, governor Stefan Ingves the governor of the Swedish uh, central bank the Riksbank uh, one of the very first central banks to pilot a central bank digital currency. Uh, Patrick Girogi, uh, governor of the Central Bank of Kenya. Um, Jose Antonio Alvarez, the CEO of Santander. And Gary Gorton, who's a professor of finance at the Yale School of Management, who has written some uh, in very important papers uh, on how we might think about um, digital currencies. Um, Gary, I'm going to sort of break precedent. We often start with the policymakers, but I think given your um, uh, the analysis that you've done in this area and the contributions you've made, I think it would be very useful to have you setting uh, a little bit of the, the landscape uh, that we're seeing, that the change in payments around the world. But I think particularly um, what challenges and opportunities arise for central banks out of this. You know, we've seen as I mentioned, we've seen a number of central banks, the Chinese, uh, the People's Bank of China is also was one of the early central banks to have a pilot of uh, the central bank uh, digital currencies. In the US, the Federal Reserve said it wasn't concerned about being first, which is good because it's a long way from being first, but we have had a lot of, um, even just in recent weeks, um, statements from uh, the administ Biden administration and paper from the Federal Reserve talking about, talking in positive terms about the development of a central bank digital currency and some of the arguments um, f for having that. So, so uh, Gary, perhaps you could uh, sort of lay out for us a little bit of um, what are the key challenges facing central banks in this landscape and potentially opportunities. So let me let me just say two things. One is um, about a hundred years ago or so, every sovereign state decided that the government should have a monopoly on the production of money. And the reason was that only the government can provide a currency that trades at par with no questions asked. And only the government's currency is not subject to bank runs. So the question of whether we should have monopoly, whether states should have monopoly over money production has arisen again because stable coins are a form of privately produced money. And they've already have a foothold. And I think it's, at least in the US, it's too late to do anything about it until we have the next financial crisis. The other thing I would say, and fortunately, I think this is not so controversial as it might have been, but everybody has seen now the importance of the global financial plumbing was SWIFT. And the US Treasury was using SWIFT data, you know, before all this to track terrorists and so on. And that's going to change. When we move to blockchain, say in 10 years when everything is interoperable, the standards for how you get data are going to be completely different. And I think central banks have to be involved here to, to jointly decide what the standards are going to be and to understand how the data is going to flow. I think that's an issue that's you know, been overlooked. And is it, I mean, one of the things that uh, the Federal Reserve said in its, or the working paper that was produced by the Federal Reserve, the arguments that they, the primary arguments they gave for central banks to be in this space uh, were that if you're losing cash as a medium and cash starts to just disappear, 
um, then you need the, the public to have some access to a form of central bank, a sovereign liability. That was one main argument. The other argument was that, and you mentioned this in your paper, actually, that you can often have these private for digital currencies um, will be subject to runs and they won't provide the kind of basis, safe, secure basis for innovation and further development that you could get from a central bank digital currency. Do you think those are those are the best arguments? Um, I, I, I mean, I think I think the best arguments are the ones that were used historically. Um, I mean, you know, central bank digital currency is just a, dig, a digital form of cash. So it's a technological change where cash, you know, comes in a digital form. The cash hasn't disappeared. I mean, you know, even in Sweden, it hasn't disappeared. It's a place where the usage has really dropped. So I think, you know, the... the the main argument for a central bank digital currency are the ones that we, you know, went through 100 years ago. The other thing I would say is that the place that will benefit the most from this is cross-border transactions and global supply chains. But you can do all that with a stable coin. Uh, but unfortunately, these stable coins are vulnerable to runs, uh, just like private monies were historically. And Governor Ingves, uh as I mentioned, the, the, the risk bank was very early, uh, I think it was 2016, you announced that you would do the, the pilot uh, of, the, of the digital currency. You know, how do you think of your role as a central bank in this, in this landscape, sort of both in terms of your own intervention with the pilot, but also in potentially regulating and moderating the kind of innovation we're seeing on the private space? obvious to us maybe earlier than in some other places that we needed to sort of start thinking about these things because uh, given the technological change that was going on people were just moving out of cash and then we sort of started thinking about it kind of in a way that Gary just referred to because we started looking at what happened actually in the late 1800s what was the process that produced the the division of labor, if I call it that, between uh, central banks and what the private banks uh, used but were, were doing back then. And the basic starting point is very, very simple. In the old days, everything was on paper. Now we're moving into another world where nothing will be on paper. Now, when that technological change happens, does that, would we like to maintain roughly the same structure that has been established for about 100, 150 years ago in many, many countries, or should we just let it go? And then we came to the conclusion that no, we should not let it go because that would imply that in my country, we would only have private sector money available to the general public. And if history gives us any guidance, that's a bad idea. And all the more so in a small, very, very open economy where it's important, given that we have our own fiat currency, that people actually use that currency. Because suppose we were just sitting with our arms crossed, the whole thing moves into, I don't know what, other, other currencies. In that environment, you can forget about monetary policy as we know it because then there is no way of increasing or reducing the supply of money in the system because people would start using what I call OPM, other people's money. And producing money nowadays in a small central bank is actually a competitive business. People never, under, people never think about it in that way, but it actually, it, it actually is. And that means that what we do has to be from a transactions purpose uh, efficient, and we need to ensure that we can maintain the exchange rate between central bank money and private sector money. And if that exchange rate is not one to one, then with a fairly high likelihood, you end up with serious problems in the system. And those were exactly the problems that we had in the 1800s uh, when banks issued all sorts of notes and coins on, on, on their own, and that it created all sorts of uh, all sorts of problems and that has to do with the fact that money is not about technolo technology money is essentially what we have in our heads 
and then we need to agree on what we should have in our hands uh, moving uh, moving forward and then that speaks in favor of uh, producing a central bank digital currency but having said that I, I i just don't expect a cbdc to sort of outcompete so to speak private sector money at all it's a sort of it's it's the final thing that you can provide uh, on the public sector side in order to ensure that the system is uh, is uh, stable so that's my way of thinking about uh, where we are and actually when it comes to producing a cbdc this sounds like an, I don't know what you call it in the English language, an oxymoron. I actually looked at the e-chrona yesterday. Thanks. But, I mean, it's interesting because in a way, what you've said, the case that you've given is a little bit of a defensive case, that if we didn't develop in this way, the world was moving so fast that central that you would end up without this source of stability in the system that you must have from, from a central bank. But I guess there have also been arguments that have been more around uh, more positive, you know, that in p potentially um, one can avoid the problems of a zero of zero lower bound in the monetary policy, or even open up the way for people's people's QE. Um, that there are there are policy opportunities that could come from from a digital currency um, and innovations that could come that are not just about sort of keeping the central bank in the game. Do you do you recognize those? Oh, I understand. I understand all those arguments. And I've, I've read Ken Rogoff's book, The Curse of Cash. But it would be a, a, a very hard sell to the general public saying that we'd like you to move out of cash into a CBDC because we need to go negative. So the first thing we're going to do is going to tax you. <laughs> and with free capital flows, I mean, people will just move out of your own currency. So I do understand the, all, the, all the sort of academic, uh, academic uh, arguments for it, but particularly in small open economies where you happen to have your own currency, it would be very, very hard to uh, implement, uh, implement that. But also, I mean, let's be mindful of the fact that we've been around since 1668. And had we not changed the way we do business and the way we do things time and time again, then, of course, we had been out of this business a long, long, a long, long time ago. And we started out back in the 1600s with 20 kilo copper coins. That's extremely inefficient. And had we not gotten rid of the copper coins, moved into physical notes, then it would have been game over a long, long time ago. So now, given that, at least in my corner of the world, people are early adapters uh, when it comes to new technologies. And they're probably early adapters because there is a, a fairly good trust in what the government does. So if, you're in, so if you introduce new technological sort of things into, into our system, People, uh, people tend to uh, to use them, and then it's just it's our job to go with the flow. Well, and I guess you have, you have to say Sweden was an early adopter when it comes to central banks uh, being being the very first. And of course, you've also you were able to uh, uh, solve some of these problems before for other central banks who came after you. So I guess in the world definitely owes you uh, owes you a debt. Um, Governor uh, Garogi, uh, if I could come to you, um, one of the things uh, that motivates this discussion is a concern that this very exciting new landscape um, potentially uh, excludes as well as includes um, people and that not everyone will benefit from these innovations if we don't manage it properly. So, you know, how do you see your role in making sure that as we innovate, we are also being inclusive in these financial innovations? Thank you, Stephanie. And uh, I want to start by acknowledging uh, the Riks Bank's lead in this area and in other areas which uh, we have obviously benefited from. Um, thank you, Governor. But in terms of the issues that uh, you're asking, I think it is important to flag that uh, the discussion so far has really been around the alternative, creating alternative payments methods. And that's why you are sort of uh, um, maybe uh, comparing that with the private monies, et cetera. But there is those other elements, which is 
and some of the um, countries that are looking into this have looked uh, towards increasing financial inclusion in their own countries using CBDCs, or for that matter, enhancing the payment system efficiency. So from our perspective, we do understand that, uh, but uh, again, appreciating that not all countries are at the same starting point. So from that perspective, we um, have a whole elaborate, let's say, other uh, arrangements, and I think we know of it in the context of M-Pesa, et cetera. So in terms of payments, um, enhancing the payment system, et cetera, we are, we are much further ahead and there's little to begin. You could say there's already, we've reached diminishing returns in that particular area. But where I think the issue then uh, comes up is where you're asking about exclusion. It is true that exclusion can very well happen, but it is taken, one could look at it in the broader context of uh, financial inclusion. Why is it that uh, we have increased financial inclusion, but still have a large high double digit number um, on exclusion rate? And I think the issues that stop us today will remain um, in the context of a CBDCs. Uh, one of the reasons, or some of the reasons for high exclusion rates relate to things like cultural norms. And I think this is particularly, you could think of uh, those places where women, for instance, are somehow disadvantaged in terms of telephones, et cetera. So those will still remain. That problem will still remain. You cannot solve it with CBDCs. And in effect, if you move into that world, um, that problem will become much more acute. The issue of IDs, the issue of unethical learning, all those things would remain. So I think the point here is let's not look at CBTCs as the silver bullet um, for all the problems that we have. On the contrary, deal with the problems directly. And this is why we in Kenya have decided that the best approach is to actually have a discussion um, with the population. And we've issued a paper um, a discussion paper on CBDCs, a bit like the, um, you mentioned the US government and the US Fed has issued a discussion paper on this. After all, money is about, uh, you know, has to be accepted by the population and they, to, they need to tell us why um, they see this as, as appropriate sort of solution for their payments methods, etc. So problems need to be addressed head on and uh, dealt with and uh, whether they're in CBDC's world or in the context of the regular financial inclusion world. And do you think it's how we're, we're moving certainly in, in, in Sweden and I think in some of the other central banks that have been further ahead in this process, we seem to be moving towards a more of a, a hybrid uh, where the, it, you don't have members of the public having a direct claim or a direct account with a central bank. Is that is that where you see um, this when you're thinking about the debate that you're having with the, with the Kenyan people? Is that where you see that going or are you thinking of it going sort of the full, full way of having um, members of the public have the direct claim on the central bank? I think that the issue of whether they are on the balance sheet of the central bank, whether they are on it or not, is something that is a need, that can be solved, meaning Today and now, there are banks, there are central banks, for instance, ours, that are not allowed legally um, to have that sort of arrangement. But if we needed it, I think that one can be resolved, you know, just changing the law, um, arguing it directly. So I don't see that as something that is, uh, let's say, un un um, cannot be dealt with. I think the issues remain, which is why are we doing this? And that is why we are discussing it with the public. And at the same time, and I think uh, uh, Governor Ingers talked about their own discussion, um, their own discussion. My concern is even as we, you know, most people are coming to this argument from their own point of view. So for instance, we as uh, central bankers, there's one thing, there are two things that we always worry about, financial stability, and I think Governor Inges talked a bit about that, and also the issue of uh, you know, um, the sort of losing control of monetary policy. And I don't think those things, other institutions, for that matter, the private sector, 
um, those that are pushing private money have any concern about those things because theirs is a very much a local solution to a much bigger problem. So, governors, the, Governor Inge's point about uh, the, there is a role for the public as a public good, you know, public money or public institution, call it a central bank, with or without the CBDCs, there has to be somebody who watches um, financial stability and these are the wider issues of monetary policy. Now, Jose Antonio Al Alvarez, uh, you are usually um, the, in a panel like this, we might have several members of the private sector and one policymaker, but instead we, ha we have, you are representing all of the private financial system in this debate, so you better be good. <laughs> but often the private sector view on this is quite different. Uh, there is sometimes a feeling either explicit or beneath the surface that says central banks aren't the ones who are going to be good at innovating and they shouldn't be at the forefront of this development. We should be counting on the private sector to do, uh, to come up with all the right solutions here. Um, how do you see that, uh, the comparative advantages of the private and public sector here? Well, uh, the first thing I should say, it doesn't matter where the innovation comes from. As long as the good innovation that uh, is good for the society as a whole, doesn't matter. It comes from the central bank, the private sector. I, I am not going to make a distinction. Yeah. So in, in the, between who is innovating, uh, whoever is innovating, welcome. Yeah? Okay. That's our approach. Um, particularly in a space uh, where technology has changed, as Stefan said before, we've been doing the things in a way for many, many years. And suddenly technology allows um, a more diverse, diverse ecosystem, particularly in the payments space. Yeah? The payments space has been in space where uh, we used to have the banks, the central banks, and a few other players. Suddenly we got on the back of the new technology, the tech companies in the space, the fintechs in the space, in a world that where the number of transactions grew exponentially on the back of the new technology. Online and e-commerce me means that the number of transactions is growing exponentially, exponentially year after year. So we have suddenly this and another future that is quite interesting for a lot of business model, that is the data. So digital payments means that your capacity to gather data that enrich a variety of business models is another future that came along. Yeah. So with this explosion of the payments using the new technology available. <laughs> So let me do, and uh, I, I think the public sector has a clear role here. So in this more diverse ecosystem, the, private, the, the public sector has a, uh, I don't know, a duty of establishing a level playing field. So we have a payments space that we use the currency, doesn't matter if the currency is the traditional one or the CBDCs, we use the currency, the currency that is generally accepted. And now is used by several players in the market. The first thing is we need to establish standards. <laughs> standards on what? On first, customer protection. Second, data security. Third, data sharing. Fourth, privacy. So these kind of things, we need to have standards. Yeah? So innovation is good, but at the same time, uh, if, if we need to have, if you do an activity, you should have the same roles that other people do in the same activity, and for sure uh, the same supervision, if any. Yeah. So on this, that has been the role uh, of the of, on the central banks. So having said that, uh, the, the public sector also, we are developing. There is plenty of initiatives here and there, and there is a tremendous uh, innovation, particularly in the P2P space. You go on a country by country basis, you will find new initiatives there. Uh, are they uh, um, properly developed? 
on a country by country basis, probably the answer is yes. When you go to the cross border, probably not. Interoperability is poor. So the public sector has a role there. So makes the different innovation initiatives in different sectors uh, to translate into other countries into cross border deals is something that the public sector need to need to uh, uh, look after this. Yeah? And finally, we have the crypto, the crypto space. The crypto space, I'm not referring to the Bitcoins and the like, I'm referring more to the stable coins, digital bonds and all these things. So more kind of uh, traditional means of payments where uh, um, uh, the central banks need to have a prudential regulation. Yeah. Uh, uh, if the banks are going to have, or financial institutions are going to have these crypto assets in the balance sheet, we need a, well, some prudential approach in relation with those assets that eventually, well, eventually not, there, there are payment, means of payments today. Uh, I will stop here now. Stephanie. Do you think, just to go back onto the your point about the, the level playing field, but also the potential role for the for the prudential regulation, um, do you have a sense that uh, there is a, or would do you need to have a consistent message coming from the key regulators uh, in regard to this? For example, do you think with the stable coins, you know, Gary Gensler, the head of the SEC, has said. Uh, he's concerned about consumer protections with many uh, not being present for many stable coins. Um, and, you know, some would say you have to regulate the, provi the providers of stable coins like banks to really have um, security. Do you, do you think that is warranted or are you thinking about much more light touch? Well, Prudential, uh, the issue of stable coins back it with a collateral that maybe a CBDC or maybe the traditional currency. Naturally, this, uh, the, 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 that the, the fact, the, the very fact that the collateral should be somewhere requires some oversight yeah, from someone else. Otherwise, we face the risk that someone is cheating the system and issuing stable currency without the appropriate collateral. Yeah? So, and that, that's required. I'm not a fan of the stable currency. Yeah? So, the history tells us that all the PECs um, have had significant problems. Yeah? So at the beginning, it seems to be a great idea. At the time goes, uh, well, at least there is a strict rules behind uh, the PECs. Normally, over time, they, they, they fail. It's more uh, what the history tells us more than uh, that I do have. Probably Gary has more theory behind this, but uh, normally stable coins require strict uh, oversight. I mean, I don't know whether, um, Gary, whether you do want to come in there. I mean, I'm sort of interested in, you, you've given the historical parallel, which I suspect some of the sort of the fintech firms would would resent being uh, classed along with the sort of uh, the, the, the Wild West uh, years of private currencies in the US, but I think it's, it's quite a powerful parallel. Um, do you see US regulators um, sort of coming towards a, a, a consistent view on how these stable coins uh, outside of the central bank system should should be uh, regulated and treated? I don't think they have come to a decision other than that stable coin issuers are banks. And the terms of service of a stable coin say you can, you know, redeem your coin on demand at par. That's a bank. So the Treasury uh, President's Working Group said they're a bank. But they didn't say anything else, really. Uh, and I think I think the issuers of stable coins they understand that they have all these problems. They're trying to get some veneer of credibility by getting you know bank licenses, fintech licenses in various states. But those are not real bank charters, and they don't. As Mr. Alvarez said, there's no prudential oversight of these guys. So the top five stable coin prices all move together. Right, the, the market can't even distinguish between them. So I think I think eventually we're going to have to say they're a real bank, and they have to be regulated as a real bank. And I mean, this would really come to a head if, say, J.P. Morgan issued a stablecoin. 
right? And, you know, that would cause Congress to act right away. But, you know, then I don't think they're going to do that. But I, I mean, I don't want to be too pessimistic, but I think the stable coins are not big now, but they will be big because lots of the problems with blockchain are being solved as we speak. It's becoming uh, scalable. Um, the problem is this interoperability with the current system, and the Fed has resisted that. They won't give a master account to anybody who looks different than a bank. And that would be one way to get some oversight because you could have rules around, you know, what you have to do to get a master account. So they could, they could. I think the Fed on its own could address this, but I don't think they will. I, I think they, they want to leave it to Congress. I don't know um, whether whether others want to come in. I mean, I think I, if I was going to be sort of uh, standing in for the uh, for a fintech uh, entrepreneur, uh, I, they will often say, you know, this is all this is a sort of classic suspicion uh, of uh, the people who who perhaps don't you know don't see how clever blockchain is and don't realize that you don't need all these checks if you have the blockchain because you have the information and you can you can have you can base your you can be confident based on data not just basing on your your sort of faith in who's standing standing well, I, behind I think, these I think things most people understand the revolution how, how revolutionary blockchain is right i mean that that's not really you know a, a debate about that it, but it's not this sort of libertarian anarchist thing where you have no connection to the real world. To have, to have it be a payment system, it's got to be interoperable with banks and the payment system, right? If I, if I withdraw money from a stablecoin issuer, they have to send it somewhere, right? And right now they're going to wire it to my bank account and it's going to take like three days. So the interoperability of these issuers and the rest of the system you know, has to happen somehow. Uh, I'm I'm not not you. If I may, Stephanie, oh. so I, okay. So, so I may to react to this. Yeah. So it's not about blockchain. No, no, no. It's not about technologies. Technologies are enablers. Yeah. Of what uh, of uh, that allow you to do some innovation. Yeah. So it's about. It's more about um, financial stability than using one or another technology. I do. I, I still have in the museum of the bank some bills that were issued by Bank of Santander 160 years ago, when the banks, the private banks, were issuing their own currency, all of them were pesetas, supposed to be pesetas, the currency in Spain at that time, all of them were stable coins. Yeah? Somehow were stable coins in paper. Yeah? So when this became a monopoly, for the reason Stefan said, and, and became a monopoly because of the time and the reason was much more efficient. Yeah, so it's not about the technology. The technology is there. As long as the technology solves people's problems, we should go and use it, but using a reasonable way that allows to preserve what is a, I, was, I should say, a public good, that is the financial stability. Yeah, Governor financial is, oh. yeah no, I completely agree with Jose Antonio because as I started out saying money is what we have in our heads. Money is a common understanding of what money is as long as we agree on what it is and that requires some kind of a legal framework. And without a legal framework you have nothing. So that's where the issue sometimes goes in some sense the way I'm thinking about it astray because clearly if you come from the tech side you have not spent your days thinking about the legal aspects of what you are doing. And it's the legal framework that defines what kind of a claim you, do, you have or do not have. And that's really the issue with, with, with stable coins, because if the legal framework is not there, with a fairly high likelihood, a stable coin is an unstable coin. And you just don't know what kind of a claim you ultimately have. And that's not a technical issue. And I mean, either stable coins are kind of banks or they are money market funds or they are mutual funds. But very often when you sort of scratch on the surface, you claim that you have come up with a wonderful new technology. But when you sort of look at it for a while, you come to the conclusion, no, 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 it's not about the technology. This is just regulatory arbitrage. And uh, that's not a good thing, because if history gives us any guidance, 
those type of constructions tend to collapse uh, sooner or uh, later. And uh, one, one thing we do know is that we human beings, we never learn. If it's too good to be true, <laughs> well, that's the case. And, and you end up with a problem sooner or, uh, sooner or later. So if you create something which behaves like a bank, well, then go and get yourself a banking license. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, yeah, Governor and uh, Gorogi. Okay, very briefly, I want to associate myself with Stefan's uh, comments, particularly the issue of regulatory arbitrage. Um, that is essential. And uh, I think the example that was mentioned a moment ago about JP Morgan really brings that to the fore. Um, so, yes, they are starting. Um, these uh, private monies are started by those that are talking technology, technology, technology. It's not about technology. As a matter of fact, we should probably ban the discussion of whether it's blockchain or any of those things. Because at the end of the day, when you drive your car, you don't care what is under the hood. You're driving from point A to point B. It is the service that it is providing you that really matters. And you have a framework of that car in terms of servicing it, in terms of um, whatever it does, um, that you understand and you are satisfied, uh, comfortable with. I think it is also essential to make the point that consumers do need, feel the obligation, or rather, they feel the need and they should demand the right to have their, um, their, their, to be protected. I think that is something we cannot just throw consumer protection out the window and sort of say, well, you know, there are dots, um, there are good uh, financial companies, they'll figure it out. In the, in the context of all this, I think again and again, we've seen financial crises appear um, when we ignore some specific, let's say, risk, and it ends up sort of coming to bite consumer protection. I don't think we, at least uh, as we have it here, would, would uh, uh, countenance that. Finally, um, we in Kenya have had uh, to do a lot of that, in the co meaning um, have innovation from the point of view of the regulator on things that were not regulated. Think about the MPES uh, arrangements that we had. When we started off, frankly, there was no law. Um, there was an innovation. But what was very clear about uh, at the time is the risks. And we dealt with the risks. So the point is there wasn't any Wild West kind of maneuver, which is we can do whatever. There is no law. Um, the laws actually came back later. I mean, were put in place you know, seven years later. Um, during that time, we managed the system based on a sort of agreement. Um, now, legally, that was sufficient, but I think the point that uh, Stefan mentioned that at the end of the day, you do need a legal framework that protects consumers and deals with all the, let's say, pertinent issues that we as uh, central banks worry about, particularly when the crisis comes. When the sun is shining, nobody worries. When uh, there is a crisis, that's when we come up to clean. That's when we we come to clean up the mess. And I think the cost will be less if we dealt with it at the beginning. Well, as as, as Stefan said, that the, we only we would ever learn, and maybe the only times where we do learn temporarily is from in financial terms. Anyway, is when we have a crisis. So I guess I'm interested in um, any of you uh, whether you think this will require um, a, a crisis involv involving stable coins, and if so. How how imminent is that kind of um, uh, car crash uh, in this world, or are we still at the very early stages that we couldn't really have a car crash quite yet? We'll have a car crash, but not quite yet. And I, <laughs> I think it's, it's it's only when we have the car crash that this will get a lot of attention. Um, for me, I would agree with Gary, uh, but I think uh, the issues also. Uh, not so much the car crash, but maybe the, a big issue is this whole business of fraud. And I think uh, we'll probably have a you know, mighty mistake um, that maybe would awaken us and require some uh, closer, uh, let's say, oversight. Um, so I don't know. I, that's the car crash that I'm thinking of. I definitely don't want to countenance 
a sort of a global financial crisis or any of those sort of crashes. Thank you. But how likely is it that you're going to get the kind of um, cooperation of international institutions, regulators, um, to resolve these kind of issues? I mean, I'm thinking even when we think of shadow banking and we think of uh, systemically important institutions, it's taken, you know, the FSB has taken a very long time, the Financial Stability Board, to address issues that have been talked about for a long time, but there are vested interests that prevent it from happening. I'm just, we're not, we're quite, we're, we have central banks who are innovating in this space and thinking hard about it, but we're, it seems we're quite far away from having an international approach or even a, a mechanism for doing that. Governing this. Well, once in a while, actually, the, the, the public sector can make a, 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 an important contribution, and that is when you start talking about standards. Sometimes it takes a long, long time to, uh, to do it, but here you can make a, we can make a difference because very often it's hard for individual private sector institutions, individual banks, to sort of move from one equilibrium to another equilibrium. It may be well understood that there is a better equilibrium in the future, but you just can't do it on your own and you can't get all the competitors in one room and decide on what to do. But that actually central banks can do. Still in the central banking community, it can take years and years of uh, talking about these things. But let me mention, and you mentioned, uh, Stephanie, that earlier, payment systems. I mean, today, when it comes to cross-border payments, that issue has been solved at the technical level. But what remains is how to agree on how to do these transactions when it comes to ideally global, but at least regional standardization. And that's almost impossible for the private sector to, to, to reach an agreement on. So we just have to keep, uh, uh, keep at it. But let me mention, in, in a European context, the, the TIPS system, which is uh, provided uh, by the ECB to, to, to uh, execute uh, small value transactions 24-7, I mean, that system can actually be used also for cross-border purposes. And on the technical side, that has already been solved. The next step is actually for us to reach some kind of an agreement within uh, within Europe, and then we'll have to take it from there uh, step by uh, step by step. But to come up with a grand global plan, that will never fly. So you just have to enjoy small successes and keep at it for a long, long time. <laughs> um, I had one. We're going to. Oh yes, Governor Goroge. I just wanted to say that actually there's a lot of discussions in the, in the context of the, in the African subcontinent um, because uh, in some sense it is the regional solution or the cross-border transactions in the region are very important for improvement in a sort of uh, trade arrangements or supporting the um, intra-Africa trade and indeed also other concerns as you know with regard to the um, to the U.S. dollar space, etc. So I think the point is those sort of crises, like the one in Ukraine, etc., um, does help to focus the minds. Can I just? We're going to run out of time, but I'm interested, perhaps, um, from uh, Gary Gorton because of his historical uh, perspective. Even for, given we have said that it's not always about the technology and that these issues come up again and again in different forms through history. But I guess one thing that one could say was different about this, about uh, the potential of a central bank digital currency, would be the, the degree of information, the degree of knowledge that a central bank could have about its citizens and the all the transactions being undertaken by individual citizens. Um, and Against that, we have, you know, quite large suspicions around government these days and um, concern around privacy. Do you think that is one different element to this debate that central banks are going to have to deal with, the concern about privacy? Uh, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's two issues. One issue is the central bank, you know, at least for large transactions, needs to know the identity of those who are transacting. Right, and that's, that's why SWIFT data is important. But you can set a threshold and say transactions you know, below this number, you know, we don't care about, you just do all that anonymously. 
And then, of course, this threshold is going to have to change because, you know, if the system is efficient, you can break the big transactions and all these little transactions. So some arrangement about what is going to be anonymous and what is not going to be anonymous is going to be required. But the central bank has to have credibility in all this. I mean, I think if you even say, you know, we're going to have a negative interest rate, people are not going to want to use it, right? And we saw in Ecuador that their central bank digital currency completely failed because people didn't trust the central bank. And, you know, so that that's absolutely at the core of this. I think that's um, it may even be a very good if we talk if we have a non central banker talking about belief in central banks, uh, that is a very appropriate place for a BIS <laughs> panel to end. Um, uh, it, I am only I'm slightly reminded your example reminds me that the, the Keynes suggestion just to have currencies with use by dates, um, if you really just want people to, to spend them and then you wouldn't necessarily have to have the confidence either. But I appreciate, uh, thank you to all of you for an excellent, uh, very high level debate. I'm sure we will continue to be discussing these issues but uh, we have a very good basis here. So um, Professor Gary Gorton, Governor Stefan Ingves, Governor Patrick Goregi, and Jose Antonio uh, Alvarez from uh, Santander, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.